Hi everyone, um, your teacher Shane Thompson asked me to speak to you and give a guest lecture about archaeology and text. And so I looked through the course materials for this class and I, I did some of the readings and I noticed that uh, most of the things you're reading are about um, archaeology and text in the abstract. So how we know what we know about the ancient world, how textual material and material records inform one another, etc. So I thought it might be nice uh, for my small part in this class to tell you a story from a time when we had not yet formalized these concepts, from a time when European museums unapologetically stole texts as objects or as archaeology with little regard for their provenance or context. I should note that this story that I'm going to read to you is highly problematic for a number of reasons, but I am not here to condone any of these behaviors. Uh, at the same time, I'm not abdicating my responsibility for these actions. Uh, the things that happened in this story uh, and, and many other similar stories created the modern field of Egyptology, uh, which I am, you know, wh which is my field. I'm a part of it. Uh, so I am in some sense responsible for these things and I'm not hiding from that. Uh, but then before I read it, I need to tell you that I am in no way uh, defending this behavior. So the story I'm going to read is from uh, E.A. Wallace's Budge autobiography called By Nile and Tigris. Um, it was first published in 1920, and the events that it describes um, in these particular scenes would have taken place in the year 1887, so more than 30 years before they were actually published. And it's pretty likely that Budge took some creative liberties with the facts. Um, as I say, you should never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, but it is also likely that most of this story is true as the results of these events are still plain to see. So here I'm going to get started with the excerpt. Um, if you get tired of listening to me read, you can always go. Um, the, the PDF is online. I'll put a link in the description of this video so you can go read for yourself. But I'm just going to read a little bit of this to you and uh, comment on it. Uh, and we're beginning on page just one second. I neglected to write this down in my notes. We're beginning on page 137 in his book. Okay. Soon after my return to Luxor, I set out with some natives one evening for the place on the western bank where the finds of papyri had been made. Here I found a rich store of fine and rare objects, and among them the largest roll of papyrus I had ever seen. The roll was tied round with a thick band of papyrus cord and was in a perfect state of preservation. And the clay seal which kept together the ends of the cord was unbroken. The roll lay in a rectangular niche in the north wall of the sarcophagus chamber, among a few hard stone amulets. It seemed like sacrilege to break the seal and untie the cord, but when I copied the name on the seal, I did so, for otherwise it would have been impossible to find out the contents of the papyrus. We unrolled a, a few feet of the papyrus an inch or so at a time, for it was very brittle, and I was amazed at the beauty and freshness of the colors of the human figures and animals, which, in the dim light of the candles and the heated air of the tomb, seemed to be alive. A glimpse of the judgment scene showed that the roll was a large and complex codex of the Per Imheru, or Book of the Dead. Skip ahead a little bit. Um, so, just to be clear, um, Budge is going with some antiquities dealers in the late 19th century to a tomb near Luxor where they have found some very ancient papyri, and upon finding them in the tomb, he has broken the seals off the papyrus and um, started to unroll them. And what he found were um, uh, beautiful human and animal figures painted on the papyrus, um, which you should see a picture of. Uh, I'm going to edit this video and put pictures in. So you should see a picture of that here. OK, continuing on. In other places, we found other papyri. Among them, the papyrus of the priestess Anhai in its original painted wooden case, which was in the form of the triune god of the resurrection, Ptah Sokar Usir and a leather roll containing chapters of the Book of the Dead with beautifully painted vignettes and various other objects of the highest interest and importance. I took possession of all these papyri, etc., and we returned to Luxor at daybreak. Having had some idea of the things which I was going to get, I had taken care to set a tinsmith to work to, at making cylindrical tin boxes. So I just want to point out that little detail, which I, I personally really enjoy. Um, so he's found these papyri, he's in Luxor, and he's got to get them back to the British Museum somehow. So he does that by actually just hiring someone to make little tin cases for the papyri so they can be shipped back. So um, it makes perfect sense. It's a, a, a practical choice, um, but it also shows just how um, unofficial 
or, or uh, not yet established these methods were. So he's, he's basically, he budges on his own in terms of like finding a way to ship these things back to London. Um, and when we returned from our all-night expedition, I found them ready waiting for me. We then rolled each papyrus in layers of cotton and placed it in its box and tied the box up in something, uh, words a little hard to read, or coarse linen cloth. And, with, and when all the papyri and other objects were packed up, we deposited the boxes in a safe place. This done, we all adjourned a little after sunrise to a house since demolished, belonging to Muhammad Muhasib, which stood on the river front and went up on the roof to enjoy the marvelous freshness of the early morning in Egypt and to drink coffee. Whilst we were seated there discussing the events of the past night, a little son of the house called Mursi came up on the roof and going up to his father, told him that some soldiers and police had come to the house and were then below in the courtyard. We looked over the low wall of the roof and we saw several of the police in the courtyard and some soldiers posted outside as sentries. We went downstairs and the officer in charge of the police told us that the chief of the police of Luxor had received orders during the night from Monsieur Grabeau, the director of the service of antiquities, to take possession of every house containing antiquities in Luxor and to arrest their owners and myself if found holding communication with them. Uh, so long story short, um, the, the chief of police of Luxor comes to arrest Budge and all his associates on the order of the head of the antiquity service who's named Grebeau. Um, and Grebeau and Budge are kind of enemies um, so much of this story is very clearly mirrored in um, in Indiana Jones. And there's the there's like Indy and he's trying to find things, and then there's the other guy whose name I can't think of right now, the German guy who's always uh, getting there first. You kind of see that with Budge and Grabo in this. Um, so uh, so so Budge speaks to the chief of police. I asked to see the warrants for the arrest. And he told me that Monsieur Grebeau would produce them later on in the day. I asked him where Monsieur Grebeau was, and he told me at Nagata, a village about 12 miles to the north of Luxor, and went on to say that Monsieur Grebeau had sent a runner from that place with instructions to the chief of police at Luxor to do what they were doing that, to do what they were then doing, that is, to take possession of the houses and all dealers and to arrest us. He then told Mohammed and myself that we were arrested. At this moment, the runner who had been sent by Grebeau joined our assembly in the casual way that Orientals have. Again, not my words. Um, he joined our assembly in the casual way that Orientals have and asked for Bakshish, thinking that he had done a meritorious thing in coming to Luxor so quickly. We gave him good Bakshish and then began to question him. We learned that Mr. Grebeau had failed to reach Luxor the day before because the Rias, or captain of his steamer, had managed to run the steamer onto a sandbank a little to the north of Nagata, where it remained for two days. It then came out that the captain had made all arrangements to celebrate the marriage of his daughter and invited many friends to witness the ceremony and assist at the subsequent feast, which was to take place at Nagata on the very day on which Monsieur Grebeau was timed to arrive at Luxor. As the captain felt obliged to be present at his daughter's marriage and the crew wanted to take part in the wedding festivities, naturally none of the attempts which they made to refloat the steamer were successful. Our informant, who knew quite well that the dealers in Luxor were not pining for a visit from Monsieur Grebeau, further told us that he thought the steamer could not arrive that day or the day after. According to him, Monsieur Grebeau determined to leave his steamer and to, arrive, and to ride to Luxor, and his crew agreed that it was the best thing to do under the circumstances. But when he sent for a donkey, it was found that there was not a donkey in the whole village, and it transpired that as soon as the villagers heard of his decision to ride to Luxor, they drove their donkeys out into the fields and neighboring villages so that they might not be hired for Monsieur Grebeau's use. The runner's information was of great use to us, we, for we saw that we were not likely to be troubled by Monsieur Grebeau that day, and as we had much to do, we wanted the whole day clear of interruptions. Meanwhile, we all needed breakfast, and Mohammed Mahasib had a very satisfying meal for him, prepared, and invited the police and the soldiers to share it with us. This they gladly agreed to do, and as we ate, we arranged with them that we were to be free to go about our business all day. And as I had no reason for going away from Luxor that day, I told the police officer that I would not leave the town until the steamer arrived from Aswan, when I should embark in her and proceed to Cairo. When we had finished our meal, the police officer took possession of the house and posted watchmen on the roof and a sentry at each corner of the building. He then went to the houses of the other dealers and sealed them and set guards over them. So just to summarize, um, Grabeau is, is looking for Budge and has ordered to have him arrested. He has just found this magnificent papyrus that he wants to get back to London, and he's had little boxes made and he's had them all packed up and they are being stored in the house of an antiquities dealer in Luxor 
Um, but they are all now under house arrest, um, trying to figure out what to do next. And now we get another little interlude that I considered taking out of this uh, part that I'm reading to you because it's already gotten a bit long and uh, I, I'm afraid that some of you might, might have gotten bored with the story already, but I went ahead and kept it in because it's absolutely fascinating that this part is injected into the story right here. And uh, I, I think if you, if you hear me out, you'll see why. So um, the next little interlude. In the course of the day, a man arrived from Haji Kandil, bringing with him some half dozen of the clay tablets which had been found accidentally by a woman at Tel El Amarna. And he asked me to look at them and to tell him if they were Qadim, i.e. old, or Jadid, i.e. new, that is to say whether they were genuine or forgeries. The woman who found them thought they were bits of old clay and useless and sold the whole find of over 300 tablets to a neighbor for 10 piastres, uh, which is a very small amount of money. Uh, I don't know how much it was then, but uh, today Egyptian pounds are divided into 100 piastres, like dollars and cents. And uh, so it, it would be the equivalent today of um, one-tenth of an Egyptian pound, which is worth, you know, pennies. Uh, I think at that time it, it was more than that, but still a, a tiny amount of money, um, you know, anywhere from 10 cents to $20, but not a lot of money. The, purchase, the purchaser took them into the village of Haji Kandil, and they changed hands for 10 Egyptian pounds. But those who bought them knew nothing about what they were buying. And when they had bought them, they sent a man to Cairo with a few of them to show the dealers, both native and European. Some of the European dealers thought they were old, and some thought they were new. And they agreed together to declare the tablets forgeries so that they might buy them at their own price as specimens of modern imitations. So the dealers are conspiring to declare these um, objects fakes so that they can buy them more cheaply. The dealers in Upper Egypt believed them to be genuine and refused to sell, and having heard that I had some knowledge of cuneiform, they sent to me the man mentioned above and asked me to say whether they were forgeries or not, and they offered to pay me for my information. When I examined the tablets, I found that the matter was not as simple as it looked. In shape and form and color and material, the tablets were unlike any I had ever seen in London or Paris, and the writing on all of them was of a most unusual character and puzzled me for hours. By degrees, I came to the conclusion that the tablets were certainly not forgeries, and that they were neither royal annals nor historical inscriptions in the ordinary sense of the word, nor business or commercial documents. Whilst I was examining the half dozen, dozen tablets brought to me, a second man from Haji Kandil arrived with 76 more of the tablets, some of them quite large. On the largest and best written of the second lot of tablets, I was able to make out the words Ana Nibmu Ariya, i.e. Tu Nimuria, and on another the words Ana Niimuria Sharmatu Misri, i.e. Tenimuria, king of the land of Egypt. Um, and if, for those who are listening closely, uh, Nimuria is who we call Neb Ma'atre or Amenhotep III. So it's a, a real king of Egypt. These two tablets were certainly letters addressed to a king of Egypt called Nimuria or Nimuria. On another tablet, I made out clearly the opening words, An Nipuria Sharmatu Masri, i.e. To Nipuria, king of the land of Egypt. There was no doubt that this tablet was a letter addressed to another king of Egypt. The opening words of nearly all the tablets proved them to be letters or dispatches, and I felt certain that the tablets were both genuine and of very great historical importance. Uh, he was incidentally correct. These are the Amarna tablets, which are one of the most important historical sources that we have from ancient Egypt. And this is how they were found, completely by accident. Up to the moment when I arrived at that conclusion, neither of the men from Haji Kandil had offered the tablets to me for purchase, and I suspected that they were simply waiting for my decision as to their genuineness, to take them away and ask a very high price for them, a, pr a price beyond anything I had the power to give. Therefore, before telling the dealers my opinion about the tablets, I arranged with them to make no charge for my examination of them and to be allowed to take possession of the 82 tablets forthwith. They asked me to fix the price which I was prepared to pay for the tablets, and I did so, and though they had to wait a whole year for their money, they made no attempt to demand more than the sum which they agreed with me to accept. I then tried to make arrangements with the men from Haji Kandil to get the remainder of the tablets from Tel Al Amarna into my possession, but they told me that they belonged to dealers who were in treaty with an agent of the Berlin Museum in Cairo. Among the tablets was a very large one, about 20 inches long and broad in proportion. We now know that it contained a list of the dowry of a Mesopotamian princess who was going to marry a king of Egypt. The man who was taking this to Cairo hid it between his inner garments and covered himself with his great cloak. As he stepped up into the railway coach, this tablet slipped from his clothes and fell on the bed of the railway and broke in pieces. 
Many natives in the train and on the platform witnessed the accident and talked freely about it, and thus the news of the discovery of the tablet reached the ears of the director of antiquities. He at once telegraphed to the mudir of Asyut and ordered him to arrest and put in prison everyone who was found to be in possession of tablets, and, as we have seen, he himself set out for Upper Egypt to seize all the tablets he could find. Meanwhile, a gentleman in Cairo who had obtained four of the smaller tablets and paid 100 Egyptian pounds for them, showed them to an English professor who promptly wrote an article upon them and published it in an English newspaper. He postdated the tablets by nearly 900 years and entirely misunderstood the nature of their contents. The only effect of his article was to increase the importance of the tablets in the eyes of the dealers and, in consequence, to raise their prices and to make the acquisition of the rest of the find more difficult for everyone. So you can see Budge is not very happy with this. Um, I don't know who this is. I haven't done the, the background research to find this paper, but um, somebody wrote a paper about the Amarna letters when they were first discovered and evidently got quite a lot wrong, uh, but did bring a lot of attention to them. And that's why the, uh, the director of the antiquity service is currently holding Budge under house arrest. Okay. In the afternoon of that day, another runner sent by Monsieur Gribeau arrived, and he reported that the director of antiquities had managed to get his steamer off the sandbank, and that he expected to arrive in Luxor sometime the following day. The runner brought further orders to the chief of the police to keep strict watch over the houses which had been sealed, and especially to be careful that the two dealers, Muhammad Muhasib and Abd al-Majid, or Majid, I don't know, uh, did not leave the town. With myself, he said he would deal personally on his arrival. Now, among the houses that were sealed and guarded was a small one that abutted on the wall of the garden of the old Luxor Hotel. This house was a source of considerable anxiety to me, for in it I had stored the tins containing the papyri, several cases of antiquas, some boxes of skulls for Professor McAllister, and a fine coffin and mummy from Achmim, which the Sardar had asked me to buy for him to present to the Swansea Museum. Besides these objects, there were several cases of things which belonged to dealers in the town who used the house as a safe place of storage. This house had good thick mud walls and a sort of sardab, or basement, where many antiquas were stored. As his end wall was built against a, the garden wall of the Luxor Hotel, which was at least two feet thick, the house was regarded as one of the safest magazines in Luxor. When the Luxor dealers and other men who had possessions in the house saw it sealed up, and guards posted about it, and heard that it would be one of the first houses to be opened and its contents confiscated as soon as Grebeau arrived, they first invited the guards to drink cognac with them and then tried to bribe them to go away for an hour. But the guards stoutly refused to drink and to leave their posts. The dealers commended the fidelity of the guards and paid them high compliments, and then, making a virtue of necessity, went away and left them. But they did not forget that the house abutted on the garden wall, and they went and had an interview with the resident manager of the hotel and told him of their difficulty and of their imminent loss. The result of their conversation was that a, about sunset, a, num a number of sturdy gardeners and workmen appeared with their digging tools and baskets, and they dug under that part of the garden wall which was next to the house and right through into the sardab of the house. They made scarcely any noise, and they cut through the soft, unbaked mud bricks without difficulty. Whilst they were digging out the mud, other men brought pieces of stout something, planks, uh, some sort of planks, and they shored up the top and sides of their opening, which was about two feet square, to prevent any fall of bricks from the garden wall. As I watched the work with the manager, it seemed to me that the gardeners were particularly skilled housebreakers, and that they must have had much practice. It appears incredible, but the whole of the digging was carried out without the knowledge of the watchmen on the roof of the house and the sentries outside it. But it seemed unwise to rely overmuch on the silence of our operations, and we therefore arranged to give the police and the soldiers a meal, for they were both hungry and thirsty. Uh, Monsieur Pagnon, the proprietor of the hotel, had a substantial supper prepared for them, i.e. half a sheep boiled with several pounds of rice and served up in pieces with sliced lemons and raisins on a huge brass tray. When all were squatting round the tray on the ground, a large bowl of boiling mutton fat was poured over the rice, and the hungry fell to and scooped up the savory mess with their hands. Whilst they were eating happily, man after man went into the sardab of the house and brought out, piece by piece and box by box, everything which was of the slightest value commercially, with the exception of the mummy and coffin, which I had purchased at the sardar's request. I thought it well to leave these to be confiscated by Monsieur Grebeau, so that the British authorities in Cairo might have experience of his tactics. In this way, we saved the papyrus of Ani and all the rest of my acquisitions from the officials of the Service of Antiquities, and all Luxor rejoiced. So that is the mostly true story of how the papyrus of Ani and some of the Amarna letters wound up in the British Museum. Uh, they're still there to this day, and I highly encourage you to visit them. Uh, there's obviously a great deal more to be said about their method of acquisition, 
how archaeological it might be, and who rightfully owns objects like these. So I hope this story will spark some interesting discussions. Thanks.